reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Gary, uh, you have become famous, and in some circles infamous, for extending the idea of self-interest to numerous areas of life heretofore untouched by this nefarious doctrine. In my experience, whenever I try to repeat what somebody believes by self-interest, they tell me I'm wrong. So I think it's useful to start by your saying what you believe by this, and then we'll carry on. Yeah. Okay, that, that's uh, quite legitimate. There is a lot of differences of opinion about what self-interest means, and I use it in a specific context, and at least to understand what I've been trying to do, the context is, is, is crucial to understand. Now, it's, it surely does not mean an emphasis on materialism, uh, selfishness, or things of that type. I mean, that's part of it, of course, at times. What I've tried to do is extend the economist concept of self-interest to a broader range of problems and still make use of the analytical techniques that have been developed in economics, although, of course, are used also by people in other disciplines. And let me try to elaborate a, a little bit on what I mean by that. The basic techniques is to assume that people are trying to maximize their well-being, to make themselves, in, in, in a crude sense, as happy as they can, given their circumstances, given their information, given their ability to foresee the future. And they try as best they can to take account of their current actions on their future consequences for them or for people they are concerned about. So that's the analytical techniques. Now, substantively, however, I, th I look at my work as trying to broaden what economists do and the kinds of concepts economists deal with. So I've tried to uh, uh, bring into this sort of framework uh, prejudice, hatred of groups, love of individuals, altruism, guilt, feelings, Why don't we duty. start there? And I'm just going to say, pick up altruism. Good. Okay. Now, what I do with altruism, and what other people who are working on this try to do, is say, assume that people are concerned in the simplest way. Let's take a very simple formulation of it. We can get complicated if it's warranted. Simplest formulation, let's say a parent is uh, concerned about the well-being of his or her child, or about a spouse, or about a neighbor, or about a fellow worker. And in, the, in what determines their happiness, their well-being, enters the well-being of the child, etc., whoever they're altruistic toward. And therefore, their decisions would be related then to this concern, and they may be willing to give up some of their own goods or own uh, welfare narrowly conceived in order to improve the welfare of these people they're altruistic toward. Now, usually, when we talk about altruism, we specify that the individual involved either does not benefit or at least is not the prime beneficiary of the action. But it seems to me that your use of the term is so broad that you could cover practically any behavior. Well, that's a question that's often raised. I think it's a relevant question. I don't think so. Um, I think I use the term in the natural meaning of the term. Uh, that is, if one goes to the dictionary, altruism is identified with love, concern for others. Okay, and that's the concept. So that's why I use would, it. So, how would you? What would be ruled out? What kind of behavior is ruled out? Well, um, for example, if I'm unwilling to give up some goods because my child is in pain or if I'm willing to take care of my child when my child is in pain, that behavior would be inconsistent with my concept of altruism. 
I couldn't, I couldn't reconcile the two. Or, for example, let me make a, a specific test that has been introduced. Let's suppose I, I've been assuming and I've been arguing that X is altruistic toward Y. And Y suffers a reverse of some kind, unemployment and so on. I would predict that X would now transfer some additional resources, goods, time, or effort, to Y. And if I didn't see that, uh, that would be a contradiction. Okay. Let's try a different tack here. You know that in the free market uh, literature, let us say on entrepreneurship, some, not necessarily you, say that they are altruistic in the sense that their activities redound to the benefit of many others. The others do not take their chances at losing, but the entrepreneur takes his or her chances and the results benefit humanity greatly. Is that altruistic? No, not in my concept. That's the Adam Smith theorem, what I would call the Adam Smith theorem, that e even a bunch of selfish individuals under appropriate circumstances can lead to results that are in the public welfare. So, for example, an entrepreneur who may be perfectly selfish in my concept, not worried directly about the well-being of others, because of what he or she does and because of competitive forces, etc., etc., may well, of course, improve the well-being of others. But that's not altruism in my concept. I say that's, that's the basic result that Adam Smith uh, saw, and the greatest result, I think, in social sciences, that a collection of private Selfish individuals can may, in their collective actions, contribute to the public well-being. But you want to sharply distinguish that mm -hmm. from Adam Smith or the moral sentiments who really did deal with altruism. Now, I take it then that altruism has to include an intention to benefit others. So I want to ask off of that a, another question. How do you find out using self-interest to probe questions, what it, people's preferences are. We might call them preferences or objectives here. How do you discover what it is they really want? You know, often in life we don't know what we want. No, no obviously it's a difficult question. I mean, it's a social science question in general. How do we test hypotheses or discover uh, an implications and see if the implication is relevant. And this question has arisen a lot in, in discussions of altruism in, the, in, in, in much of the literature, but certainly in the economic literature that I'm more familiar with than some of the other literature. And I gave earlier a one type of test that if we, had, if we see an event, let's say if a child gets sick and if the parents then make some sacrifices to improve the well-being of the child, that's consistent at least with the notion of altruism. Not consistent though with the usual notions of selfishness. That would be one way I would get mm -hmm. at it. On the other hand, as people have claimed, uh, sometimes parents, uh, people may give to a charity because of social pressure to give and so on. I wouldn't call that altruism. Maybe something that also influences their behavior toward others, but it's not this, uh, the concept of altruism I'm using. I'm using, I think, the common sense notion of altruism, meaning something about love or concern. Yes. Now, if we go and ask Again, how you find out about this, your answer accords with my understanding of the doctrine of revealed preference. You look at people's behavior and you fit to that behavior a motive or an objective mm -hmm. that makes it cohere. Right. There is another question that could be asked, and I would, and you'll see immediately, it's one of the great questions often mm -hmm. asked, but I think people should have your view of this. Do you think it useful or appropriate or legitimate to ask a related question, which is, why is it that people want what they want? That is not just here they are going about achieving some preformed preference, but why is it that they have the preferences they do have in the first place? Very, uh, very important question, of course, because I think we'll learn much more about behavior if we can I have some answers to that question. That's why when I started out I said I was going to take a particularly simple case to start with where this preference is simply given and we don't 
ask for the purposes of that discussion where it came from. But obviously, a deeper question is where does it come from? And it's a question that actually has been interesting me in um, the last few years. And uh, I'm trying to do a book, which I call The Formation of Preferences. Exactly that question. All right, now it's a tough question. What I try to do is say, well, uh, people's preferences are formed by various experiences, uh, but I still put that within my uh, welfare maximizing framework. So, for example, let me give you a simple example. I may become a drug addict by taking drugs today, or I may become addicted to smoking or heavy drinking, okay? Now, if people are behaving along the lines of the way that I think they behave most of the time, they will try as best they can to anticipate the consequences of this action today for these future preferences. So they will in part influence their future preferences, okay? And they may decide or not decide to do that action. A parent may influence the preferences of their child. Let me give a historically a very important example. Uh, in most societies, parents depended when they got old on their children's support. Now, why were the children willing to support them? Well, there are a variety of reasons, social forces impinging and so on. But there were also preference formation reasons, I believe, that parents tried to influence how their children uh, acted toward, would act toward them later on by influencing their behavior to them when the children were growing up and where the parents had a significant influence on the formation of preferences. So in that case, the experiences the child is, are, is, are having with their parent is a device through which their preferences get formed. Then one can go on and on with these sorts of things. So that it's, again shows that you are continually moving on the cutting edge because my understanding has been that in the past, most economists had ruled out the question of preference formation, of why people want what they want, on the ground, on many grounds that might lead to an infinite regress and rather just say, would say something like assume preferences and go from there. So you have decided to make a break with this. Could you explain why? Well, for the obvious reasons that, you know, implied by your question that this leaves out too much. And the, and the, the challenge would be, does this way of looking at the problem illuminate what is a deeper question, a crucial question of where these preferences come from, how they get formed, and um, how they change. Uh, in the altruism case, we know, for example, uh, that the wife you may have loved when you marry her, you may hate her in three or four years, and, that, and you divorce, <laughs> and vice versa, right? And so, you know, these sort of attitudes toward altruism change, or even toward children. You don't always love your children to the same extent. You may, parents have disowned children, have rejected them, and so forth. So where does that come from? How does that get changed? An important question. Uh, I don't claim to have any means, uh, any, any uh, a large fraction of the answers, but it's a question, I think, two things. So one, if one wants to try to go deeper into behavior, you have to try to look at, and two, and this would be the more controversial side of it, that I think the particular framework that I've been uh, putting forward here in, in my work and other people have put forward is useful in trying to get at that question. I see here that you have, in a way, taken the self-interest axiom into the Holy of Holies, into that place where it was never supposed to go, into love and affection and hate and the family. So why don't you extend for us a little bit your reach and talk about some of the other subjects to which you have applied this, like prejudice. Okay. My first book was on uh, economics of discrimination. Now, obviously, discrimination has been with the world ever since we get, we've been able to record it. But interestingly, or maybe not, from, from your point of view, economists had really never dealt with that question. Um, and virtually no uh, 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 treatment of that issue. And my judgment, the reason why that was so difficult, or why they neglected, I don't know about it's so difficult, was that in order to, you had to deviate from one of the principal traditional assumptions that firms, let's say companies, only want to maximize their profits. They're not concerned about the fact whether they're hiring women or blacks or Jews or anybody else. So anybody who comes along is the most productive for the same price, they'll take the more productive people. Or similarly for workers or customers. 
Well, that seemed to me to rule out too much behavior. We, we know there have been lots of examples where all these groups, the workers, the unions, the uh, employers, um, customers, were willing to give up some money or whatever to uh, exercise this hatred. And so what I tried to do, again, starting with the simplest formulation, take these, these feelings as just given, uh, and say, well, how does that work itself out in the context of an economy where there's competition or monopoly, there may be unions or competitive labor markets, there are governments at work or, or not, and how do we go from this prejudice that different people feel to what we actually observe in terms of the, say, if you, if you say blacks and whites, the earnings, the occupations, the unemployment of blacks compared to whites? Well, let's stop for a moment and pick up something that is a staple of everyday conversation that if people are born equal, then how do we explain that blacks earn less than whites? How much of that is due to discrimination? How much to other factors? How did you answer this question? Well, what I tried to do statistically, and it was a very crude uh, first effort, and, other, and since then there's been a lot more sophisticated work on this question. What I tried to do in order to test some of these ideas was to try to get measures of the productivity of blacks and whites and then compare their earnings when I sort of did my best to hold productivity constant. Now productivity is difficult to measure so I use concepts like education, years of schooling, um, region of the country, age, uh, whether male or female, etc., and made comparisons, let's say, of white and black men of comparable years of school and comparable age in the same region, maybe the same city, and tried to compare what their earnings were like and found a, a sizable differential, though varied systematically the education and age and so on. Well, f subsequent work in which I've, I've not participated, but there's a whole industry now working on this, have tried to you know, make that more sophisticated. It's a very difficult question because unfortunately we don't have direct measures of productivity. See, if a very strict market view were held, then employers would not discriminate on the basis of race or gender, but would seek to do the best they could for themselves materially. So. Perhaps you could just tell us, did you find this true or almost true or not true at all? Well, not com certainly not fully true and probably not entirely true. Um, that is, see, I, what, one of the points of departure of my analysis was to deny that proposition, uh, to say that you could have perfect competition in the usual meanings of that term in economics right. and nevertheless still have surviving in the market uh, discrimination from, by employers. Now, competition would tend to introduce forces that could reduce the amount that would survive. The less discriminating employers would tend to expand. You'd have to pay the cost of your discriminating because if you gave up hiring, let's say, a very productive woman uh, in order to prefer a man, uh, it, you would, it would cost you to do that because you're giving it up. But nevertheless, that could survive. That was the point of, of my argument. It could survive under competitive conditions. And therefore, uh, in, in order to believe that, let's say, in the U.S. economy, which is on the whole a competitive economy, not perfectly so, but on the whole certainly a competitive economy, and has been, that you could have in that economy, you did in fact have in that economy, discrimination against particular groups. And therefore, it could be perfectly consistent with competition. That was not understood by the economics profession. In fact, some economists still don't understand that proposition and act as if my analysis or similar analysis would lead on to competition to no discrimination. It's just right, not that's true. That's why I wanted you yeah. to uh, bring this yeah. out. Now, let's pick one more application and then I'll go into some fundamental uh, questions here. Consumption. You have done work of importance in this field. Show us how what people consume connects to their preferences? Well, I've worked on that, you know, along, uh, along with, um, it's a staple of economics to try to deal with consumption. And the traditional approach of economists, and I'll give you a few wrinkles that maybe I added and other people have added to it. The traditional approach would be to say that people had preferences over different goods that they would go out in the marketplace. 
they have a limited amount of income, goods cost certain prices, and they're trying to maximize the value of this preference, their utility, and so then they would spend across different goods until they reach the maximum. And that's okay as a starting point. If you go to any textbook in economics, even pretty advanced textbook, that's the way they're going to treat it. Now again, I felt there were limitations in that point of view, and so I have tried to make a few alterations in that. One, that people don't just go out and buy what they consume, that uh, each household is a little bit of a factory that produces. They buy, what you buy are raw materials. So you go out, you go to a supermarket, you buy apples and you buy, um, you buy meat. And we don't, we don't take the meat and, and, and start eating the raw meat. We cook it and it makes a big difference whether you can cook it well or whether you can cook it poorly for what sort of pleasures you get on it. You use time, you put a lot of time into the process, you have to consider how people use their time. And so you have to, come, you have to take a little more complicated view that these households are in you know, small factories, so to speak, and uh, they're allocating their time of different members and they're buying these goods, and then they're uh, trying to get as much of this pleasure as possible. And that, I think, leads to some useful insights. For example, when a wife's time becomes more valuable, it, it clearly affects what she does. She um, is more likely to go to work, and she's also more likely to buy frozen foods. The family's more likely to eat out more. So you look at the increase in eating out as, as people have gotten wealthy, as women have worked more. And it changes a lot in the, uh, uh, the consumption patterns that um, we observe in society. Try just once more to say, what does the understanding of self-interest add to the understanding of consumption? Well, Self-interest, in the sense I've been using it at this point, uh, I think gives us a few predictions or implications for behavior. Uh, um, the most famous one is that when price goes down, people consume more. That's a pretty simple implication. There may be other ways to get it, but this is certainly a strong implication of this type of analysis. And people say, well, that's pretty obvious, but in certain contexts, it isn't obvious. And it's resisted by people sometimes from other disciplines. So for example, uh, it's also applicable to having children. I come back a little bit to the family. So when the cost of children goes down, either through a subsidy from the government or other reasons, um, uh, this predicts people have more children. And sometimes people deny that type of prediction. Or to take another example, if the cost of um, drugs go down, people will consume more drugs. Um, conversely, the cost of drugs goes up, people will consume less drugs. Now, often people deny that implication, particularly for addicts, but it's, it follows from this sort of analysis. So probably the most significant implication is this particular one. There are a few others that, are, that can be useful, but this, I think, is the most important. Supposing I were to say that goods are not merely consumed materially, but they're forms of communication. They enable people to interact with others. They exclude some people. They include others. How would you deal with social influences on consumption? Yeah. Well, it's very important. And, I, and unfortunately, economists have been slow in dealing with those issues. And I can put myself, of course, in that category. But um, I, in recent years, I've been trying to get into that problem because it's obviously of great importance. I mean, we, we don't consume. We're not Robinson Crusoe's, which is the traditional model uh, uh, in economics, but we're in a society, I mean, it's stressed by sociologists and political scientists and others, and I think economists have to pay it more attention. And I think we can say something about it. And let me give you a, a simple uh, illustration uh, of that. Um, it's a paper I, I recently wrote called um, Q, uh, having to do with cues in restaurants. And the question I put was, well, why is it that some restaurants um, have persistent queues? There's one here in Palo Alto uh, called, uh, called the Fish Market, where I, I got stimulated to work on this problem uh, from. And you, no, no matter when you go in the evening, you more or less wait in line. And um, why is it this restaurant doesn't raise price? The traditional an economic answer to that problem would be, well, you have a queue, you raise price, you make more profits, and you do better. 
but it didn't seem to be explaining this in similar phenomena. And so I came up with a answer, I don't know if it's the right answer, um, that based on social forces. Uh, that people went to restaurants in part as a function of whether other people are going to restaurants. They're in restaurants and they're not so in restaurants. And the fish market is an in restaurant because I make the point in this paper that just across the street from the fish market, literally across the street from the fish market, is another fish restaurant that's virtually never crowded, uh, that has comparable quality food, slightly higher prices, but not much higher to justify the enormous difference, and yet people don't go to that restaurant. The question is why? Well, again, uh, it seemed to me the obvious answer to that was that people's behavior is a function of, of in, part, in this case, what other people are doing. They want to be considered in, they want to be among the leaders, and so on. Well, when you take that idea, which is well known, of course, to people outside of economics, but it's not really been brought much into economics. When you take that, I show in a, in a simple way, it gets a little technical, but in a simple way, how that could explain this f phenomena of persistent cues and without raising price. And I, I applied it to book publishing, uh, Brief History of Time, the book that sold over a million copies, you know, Hawkins' book on, mm -hmm. uh, a book that's almost impossible to understand, very technically difficult book. Uh, I tried and gave it up, yet it sold a million one hundred thousand copies. How many people could understand that book of that? Uh, less than one percent, one tenth of one percent? That's, that's about the fraction I would put. Right. So obviously people aren't buying that book because they thought they could understand it. So that's another example of social forces, which again I brought into the same sort of uh, phenomenon. And there are there many types of consumption. Consumption, as you say, is an instrument of communication, expression, uh, Well, uh, if you're in the book business and part of your business is to find out what other people are doing, perhaps so you will bet in the same direction so if you lose you can say everybody else did the same right. and perhaps to get some idea of uh, current trends uh, that should certainly work. I want to bring in a current event now and see if we can apply this, these tools to it. This morning on the radio I heard uh, that President Clinton excoriated drug manufacturers on the grounds that the price of vaccinations was too high, uh, that they were making more money than other industries, and that something should be done, presumably voluntarily, uh, by uh, them. Now, in a market situation, we would assume that the way to deal with this would be to look at the question of entry into the industry. If you can get so rich doing this, how come there aren't more people? Uh, what would a self-interest approach tell a person about an issue like this, which I'm sure you haven't thought much about, because I only heard it this morning. <laughs> well, I mean, this is a, a drug industry is, is periodically under pressure because they're charging too much, okay? And the question is, what does that mean, and how does, how does a self-interested uh, uh, story? And most economists who have looked at that, of course, have tried to give it a self-interested interpretation. And the way I think it would go would be something along the following lines. I'm no expert on this industry, but this is the way the story would go. All right, one would say, well, one has a patent system, so uh, uh, many uh, drugs, I don't know about the particular vaccinations here, might be protected by patents. The second issue one would consider is what's the cost of research and development? This is, um, you know, for every uh, success you get, there are uh, probably 99 failures. And drug companies have very big R&D budgets, and they're betting. And these are bets that have very low odds of winning. So the successes, you have to make enough profit on the successes in order to justify the heavy investment in your failures. And therefore, to try to evaluate where the price is too high uh, given now, let me one one other thing. Let me add the, pat, the reason for giving the patent protection is obvious. If you have to bet a lot in trying to innovate, 
And if once you innovate, anybody could come in and copy it, then of course this greatly diminishes the self-interest incentive to innovate. So a self-interest analysis says that's why we have the patent system. Uh, how long it should be, et cetera, those are questions that have to be discussed. But the reason we have it, because in, in the absence of it, people, given their self-interest, given that they're not generally altruistic in their business activities, they wouldn't do it or they wouldn't do much of it. So the so self-interest explanation on the one hand explains why we have the patent system. On the second hand, uh, on the second hand it gives a possible explanation for the high prices because it says uh, the patent protects you from competition number one and if you didn't get a high price you wouldn't be making the big investment when so many of your uh, attempts at innovation fail. That's roughly speaking uh, the, at least the first few steps in a self-interested analysis of this type of problem. That's very useful. I want to use this to get back to the question that we were discussing here. Because say with vaccinations there's some idea of a just price, some idea that there should be some social limit on what can be charged here. In our conversation uh, we have seen that you, unlike many others, believe that preference formation is an important subject. And not only preference execution. And that you're doing a book on this and that you also wish to expand your, extend your reach into social influences. How then would you cope with a mm, sociological or anthropological or social science approach would say if there are social influences on understanding if most of our preferences come from our relations with other people one does notice that people except very crazy people don't usually have extremely bizarre preferences here what is the residue that is left of self in the term self-interest here. If the self is socially conditioned, not socially determined completely, but most of what we do, of course, is a product of our social, of social influences yeah. surrounding us. What's left of the self that has the interest you're talking about? Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, in many ways a profound and difficult question, but I, I've, I've thought a bit about it. Let me give my own feelings about that. I mean, I'm not going to go as deeply into the question as, you know, as the notions of free will and what we have control. Let's leave that to one side. Let's deal mainly with the issue of social versus individual influences. Uh, I agree with you, as, as we've been saying, that uh, the social aspect is important. But nevertheless, within those confines, there is a, a considerable range never, uh, still for self and choice and the kinds of considerations that we've been talking about. Um, let me give you an, an example. Um, it's, it's clear that, let's say, the neighbors we're surrounding, who surround us, may have a great deal to say with what we do, whether we keep our lawns neat, whether how our our children go out, what kind of clothing they wear, and so on, um, as well as more other attitudes, uh, what kind of groups they're in, whether the children are going to start smoking and drinking and whatever. All right, now, self comes in to well, where, do we, where do we locate? Where, what type of neighborhood? What kind of peers do we want? And you can see families making all sorts of choices, whatever income level they are. You can see the poorest families saying, well, they're concerned about their children's education. They want to get into a school district or so where their children can get a decent education. And you see another family, also, expo also equally poor and exposed to the same, uh, or maybe not the same backgrounds, but some uh, backgrounds, uh, making very different types of choices. So uh, here you have an example where the self is playing a role. Let me give you still uh, another example. Um, if, you, if, you, if you get into drugs a lot, uh, the drugs may control what you're going to do and, the, and, and, and reduces what choices you have because it's so dominating what you want. But you have self in deciding, well, do I want to get into this activity? 
um, do I want to start uh, consuming drugs or not? And people make that choice for a variety of reasons, uh, but in each of these cases, I believe, uh, there's choice involved, there's room for choice. The choice is constrained by their, their upbringing and so on, and so choices are constrained, and I perfectly accept that choices are constrained. Where I refuse to go, however, is they're so constrained there's no room for the self. Yes. There's a mixture between the two. Yes, of course. I'm going to give you an example I have thought of for this purpose here. We are sitting in a relatively enclosed room. And we will suppose a wall of water, a tsunami, is approaching us. Now, we don't need, generally, we wouldn't need theory for this, right? Just run like hell. Right. But if we assume it's a sinking ship, would you say that individual behavior is under or overdetermined? I have in mind this. Somebody will say women and children first. Somebody else will say me first and uh, grab the li lifeboat, uh, somebody else will do something like uh, that. How would your ideas of rationality help you understand how a disaster would be handled? Yeah. Well, I think uh, they're actually they're quite useful in understanding these ideas, uh, th these, many of these situations, because often you find in these situations a conflict between each individual's motivation or self-interest self and the group's interest. That's precisely, uh, there's a fire in a nightclub or in a movie theater. Now, collectively, they'd be better off having an order in which it would be determined how they get out. They went out orderly and so on. And um, maybe not everybody would survive, but you'd, you'd say you'd increase the fraction of people surviving. But who's going to be first and who's going to be last? All right? That's where the conflict between the individual and the collective occurs. So they all make this dash to get out first, and they uh, s uh, step on each other, and nobody gets out, or a much smaller fraction gets out. Uh, there are many contexts where individual uh, behavior leads collectively to a poor outcome. Um, and that in this particular case, that's the conflict between the individual self-interest and the collective interest. And there are many of these contexts. Before I mentioned the famous Adam Smith theorem, and I was careful to say under certain conditions, the collection of private interest leads to a very good outcome in your businessman. But obviously, it doesn't always happen. And I think many of these disasters are examples of cases where it, it uh, uh, may not happen. Let's take our ship is going down a little bit further. And we ask the question that you're working on in your book, not merely what did they do and what interest did they pursue, but why they had that interest. For example, just an example would be if a person has uh, say, sympathies toward a society in which there's greater equality condition, then they might seek out those people they think are worst off to save. If a... Uh, person has a hierarchical sense, they might follow the rule, that quaint phrase of women and children, and so on. So even, in other words, when we can see that it, a self has room for maneuver and is pursuing a preference or an interest, that doesn't rule out uh, the social shaping of that interest. No, no other variety of outcomes. Um, you don't get everybody at least with their current interests, having exactly the same interests. You mentioned two, I'll give you a third. Somebody might feel, well, those people whose contributions to society, whose marginal, whose productivity is, is the highest, they're the ones who should be saved, those with the most human capital. And, uh, and it may not be the women or the children or all the <laughs> lower... <laughs> yeah. I right. suppose an Ayn Randian view. Right, right, right. So there are, you know, there are different outcomes. And uh, I can't say I understand uh, uh, anywhere near fully, uh, maybe hardly at all, what is the forces that are shaping uh, the different attitudes that different people have in these situations. These are the kinds of questions I'm, I'm thinking about and trying to address, but the answers, I, I don't think, to, you know, social science has reached the answers to these questions. We, we would say they're shaped by different families you came from and uh, different immediate cultures and, and so forth, but, you know, take that more, make that more concrete and more specific with individual predictions, I don't think um, social science has reached that stage. Certainly, I don't feel I, I have the knowledge 
to do that. But it's, it's a crucial question and one I think ultimately we, we can understand a lot more about, but we don't yet. Obviously, you're still young and striving <laughs> after knowledge. 